All right, friends. Well, I have 30 minutes past the hour, so I'm just going to get started. Um, I love the communication in the chat. Let's keep that going. Uh, I will periodically look over the chat to see if there's any Q&A. Um, if, if not, I'll just keep moving on. But hi, welcome to Better Object Mapping in .NET with Dapper. My name is Kevin Griffin. I am so glad you're here with me today at Codapalooza 2020. I am so sorry that we could not be here together in person, but, you know, stuff happens. You know, wear a mask. And maybe next year we can be in person together. Uh, if you've never seen me present before, I'm sorry. Or actually, that's great. You, you're That means you have no expectations. <laughs> uh, I'm a 11-time Microsoft MVP. My focus is in ASP.NET Core uh, and Azure development. I love working with C Sharp, and I love libraries that make my life easier, which is why I have a talk dedicated to a very specific library that's made my life easier in so many ways. So I'm hoping I can just drop a little bit of knowledge for you all today. If after the fact you want to reach out to me, which I... You know, it's always possible. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter at one Kev Griff. Um, and I also do a somewhat regular Twitch stream on Twitch <laughs> at one Kev Griff. Uh, normally I talk about just random things I'm working on development that aren't client focused. And I also do some blogging at consultwithgriff.com. <clears throat> now I always get the question afterwards, Kevin, that was an all right talk. Where could I get the resources for it? Well, go to consultwithgrip.com slash dapper. Uh, I have the resources for this talk. I have the slides. I also have a replay uh, up there. So if something janky happens with this one, you you have a version of the talk that uh, is from A to B, what I'm going to be doing here today. <clears throat> so let's begin this conversation with what is object mapping? And... If you're here, you probably have used a database in the past. Let's just assume it's been SQL Server, but it could be Postgres, it could be something NoSQL based, whatnot. And let's assume if it's SQL, you run a SQL query and you get back a result set, and you know that SQL tables have uh, different columns in them, and then you have multiple rows. Uh, and then over in your code, you have you have objects and things that you can actually build logic against. And technically the two kind of match. Like the the image on the left kind of matches the image on the right, except there's no just easy translation between the two of them. And if you worked with database objects for any period of time, you know that there's one rule with database result sets. They are just kind of useless. Like you <laughs> you call a query on a SQL database and you get the result back, you, you just, you can't do anything with it. You have to put in considerable effort to extract the data from those database results. And it's why a good number of tools have popped up along the way. Now let's assume that you were doing this the hard way. Uh, and the hard way being you are talking to the SQL database directly, getting back a result set and trying to map that to an object. And an object, something that you can actually do the work with. And let's look at two things. I have my query. So select ID, first name, last name, email address, date of birth from a table called users. And I wanna map that to an object called application user that has the same properties, ID, first name, last name, so on. And the application user, there's different data types depending on what I'm getting back from the database. And I wanna, I need to get the results back. Now, select items from a table will return either zero or God knows how many <laughs> results. Yeah, it could be zero or it could be a million result sets, um, depending on how I format this query. Well, let's walk through the hard way of doing this. And if you've written ADO.net in the past, you will start shivering right now because this is awful code to write. Let's start at the top. I have my SQL statement. Okay, nothing special. Um, the next line, I wanna create a connection to my SQL database. 
So somewhere I'm injecting the connection string in, I create a new SQL connection and make sure that that's wrapped in a using statement because I don't want to leak the memory. So I either have to throw in a using statement or make sure I dispose that object when everything's said and done. Well, the SQL connection by itself is useless. You have to open the connection because why wouldn't it just open itself automatically? That's beside the point, open the connection. And then you tell that connection that you want to execute a SQL query, which you pass into it. And that will provide you with what's called a data reader. Well, a data reader is just a fancy thing that can iterate through all the rows of that result set. And you can then go through and extract out each individual column of data. So that's what we do in our while statement. While there is data in the reader, we're going to read each row one at a time. Now notice for my add statement, I'm creating a new user and I'm going to the reader and asking it, all right, well, the ID is going to be from the reader element zero, which you can go back up to the query at the top of the, at the top of the code and say, all right, ID is zero, first name is one, last name is two, email address is three and so on. Well, not only do I need to know the ordinal position of the data coming out of the reader, I also kind of need to know the type that's coming back in. So ID, I have to know that it's an int 64. So it's a long coming out of my database. Uh, first name, last name, email address are coming back as strings. I have to know that. Uh, date of birth is a date time in the database and I can pull it out as the date time here. Now there's little hacks you can do to make this a little bit more efficient. Like uh, before iterating through the reader, you can find the ordinal positions of, of columns by their column name and you can cache those away for later. Uh, there's a lot of little micro optimizations you can, you can do here, but let's not get caught up on that. This just kind of sucks the right <laughs> and right over and over and over again. There's other ways you could do it. Uh, let's take the same statement. Let's create our connection. Let's open the connection. Let's execute a reader. And then let's just load that reader into a <laughs> data table. Uh, when I first started working with .NET back in 2007, uh, I worked on a project where all the data access was done with data readers. And it's actually to the point where I thought this was the only way to do data access <laughs> in C-sharp code. So what happens is the data table, data table is really useful. It, it actually puts things in terms of column or rows and columns, and you can access things by their row number and the physical column name. Um, and when you load a reader into a data table, it's, it just extracts all that data for you uh, to the point where it's a little bit easier to use. Data tables are memory hogs. Like you can crash an application by putting too much into a data table. I've done that. <laughs> um, data table, there are use cases for data tables. They're just far and few in between nowadays. There are other ways to do this sort of thing where you're just trying to take database results and map them to objects. Like that's our whole goal here is because we need objects in order to do our work. So you've probably heard of several, at least one, if not all these uh, different frameworks. Any framework, that's kind of the most popular. This is where Microsoft, the, the data team dictated a long time ago. This is how object relational mapping should happen to .NET. Uh, I have done the circle of, of any framework. Like I loved any framework. And then when they dropped database first support, I just kind of fell off of it. Like I do not, I do not subscribe to the code first approach of any framework. Um, and that's, that's just kind of a personal professional choice and you don't have to share it. I love having that conversation with people, but as we walk through Dapper, maybe you'll appreciate why I've come to the decisions that that I like. In Hibernate is a offshoot of uh, just Hibernate, which was a Java platform. And it does the same thing. It's I believe it's more convention configuration based. So you have the database and you set up configuration against it to get your objects. And then you have micro RMs like Massive, Petapoco, um, and more. And these all are <laughs> serving the same purpose. I want to make a request to the database and get back 
uh, results set and turn those into objects. And I want to do that in few steps as possible. Well, I've come to love Dapper and Dapper is just a simple object mapper for .NET. Um, a couple of things about Dapper. First, is classified as a micro RRM, so object relational mapper. It's not, there's a lot of stuff it's not gonna do for you. It's not gonna do SQL generation. This is the thing that folks like any framework for. If you need something that can generate a select statement for you, generate an update, a delete, um, an insert, Dapper is not your, <laughs> not your kid. You need, uh, you'll need something like any framework like this. Uh, it also won't generate your databases for you, which any framework would. That's a code first approach. You define your, your objects and your schema in code and it gets generated um, initially. Now, I think we're better off not having those things because I have gone into a number of projects where we've used something like any framework um, and simple queries like inserts and deletes and updates, those are actually really hard for an ORM to grow up because you're affecting one table uh, at a time with a query. It's reads that generally suck because when you have a developer that's not developing in the language that the data is going to be queried in, they, they, they tend to make very bad decisions because the platform lets them do it. Uh, I, I learned very early in my career just how to, how to read, write basic SQL and then start building on those, uh, those ideas of understanding how a SQL database works underneath the scenes uh, and then making adjustments there. When you have a black box, like in any framework that's doing a lot of that work for you, when you run into performance issues, it's, it's going to be difficult for you to step back from that because you, it's a black box. You, you're not quite sure what's happening. Um, again, this is just more my professional opinion. And I don't want to push it on anyone, but I'd like to show you another way. The great thing about Dapper is that it's a fluent interface on data readers. So if you're already using SQL clients, um, using data readers and SQL connections, everything just kind of maps off of those. It's not a separate set of objects that you're creating, you're just, uh, it's extension methods. Um, so as we start walking through some of the examples, you'll see I'm not, I'm not really doing anything all that special. There's also no specific database implementation. So I'm gonna show everything in SQL Server, but as long as the database that you're using has ADO providers, so SQLite, SQL CE, even Firebird, Oracle, Postgres, like all those, they have ADO connectors. Uh, you should be able to use Dapper along with them. I even was chatting with one person who's using an ADO provider for Cosmos DB and Dapper works along with that, which is really cool. This is probably one of my favorite reasons for using Dapper. It was developed by the folks at Stack Overflow. Now you have probably heard of Stack Overflow. If you haven't, yeah. You should just quit now. But if you have heard of Stack Overflow, it's it's probably what one of the top three websites on the internet in terms of just general traffic in a given day. Uh, like they look at performance in terms of million requests per minute. Uh, not even that, but <laughs> much more, much more than that. But they they just concentrate on you know, efficiently getting data into databases, getting it out, because that's all Stack Overflow is, is a huge database of content. Well, they have built a ton of tools that make their lives easier in Stack Overflow land. And I'm the type of person that goes, well, if it's good enough for these sites, it's probably good enough for my dinky little things that don't do a fraction of the traffic that they do. Uh, so I give a lot of props to the team and they're active in it. Like you go look at the Dapper GitHub repo, uh, there is there is activity in there every single day. All right. So how's it work? Step number one, add the NuGet package. If you search Dapper in NuGet, you're going to get a couple things. You'll get the main Dapper package um, by Sam, Mark, and Nick. Then you also have like a, there's a Dapper contrib, which I'm not going to cover in this session. I wish, I usually don't have time to, but the, 
once you understand how Dapper works, and it's like, well, this is still too much effort. I wish there was even easier ways of writing some of this code. That's where Dapper Contrib comes in to uh, comes into play. Uh, and then there's several like Dapper extensions that other people have written. Um, yeah, I haven't tried any of those, so don't take <laughs> don't take my endorsement of them. Uh, but once you have Dapper installed, it's all extension methods off of a SQL connection. So the example on the right, I create a new connection. I have my SQL statement, and then I just execute a query. And it's really cool. So I am taking the SQL connection, telling it, execute a query. I'm passing in the SQL, but then I'm, it's a generic. So I'm telling it what object type I'm expecting back. So the SQL the query is expecting back a user ID, first name, last name, phone number. Da, da, da. Well, Dapper's going to do all that mapping for me. And my result is going to be a list of users that I can just start working with immediately. All right. And this is the fun part where we're just going to dive into some code. Now, if for any reason you want to go back and just look at any of the topics individually, I have slides for every topic I'm about to cover. Uh, but I like doing this live because it's a little bit more fun. So let's minimize that. Uh, and let's minimize you. That was the other talk I did. I have a basic ASP.NET Core 3.1 app. Um, it's nothing special. I have a controller. I've already done some of the heavy lifting. I've created my SQL connection. And you know, we just need to do some work. Over in my database... I have this Dapper demo database uh, with you know, two tables. Really, we just care about this one. It's persons. And if we load persons, I can zoom in. There's a lot of person data in here. But we have first name, middle name, last name, date of birth, last login date. What I want to do is I want to take, let's just take this basic query. Copy that. Go back over to Visual Studio. I'm going to paste it as my SQL. Now, one of the common questions I get here is, Kevin, do you actually put your SQL commands as strings in your application? And the answer is yes. Um, so we there's a there's a couple of little nuances here. For simple select statements, yes, absolutely, I will do string constants. Um, so. Uh, similar to what I did here with connection string. We'll use a string constant for our commands as long as they're just one command. A lot of the times when we start getting into more complicated queries uh, where maybe we need to do a little bit of logic and do an insert in this case and update in that case, we, we might not even do the, we won't do a string constant. We'll just do a stored procedure and we'll put that content over in the database and let the database do what the database is good at. And that's processing queries. Uh, so it really depends. Um, I have worked on many projects where, uh, yeah, so first project I ever worked on, the one with data tables all over the place, there was a file and it was called sqldata.cs. Don't ask me why I remember the name of the file, but you get in there and it is nothing but it was, it was like 10,000 lines of SQL, <laughs> um, if not more. Uh, and if you needed to change the SQL, you had to find the, the particular query in there. Um, one of the things we do is we keep the SQL query with the implementation. Uh, so if I'm using a repository pattern or if I'm using a service pattern or something, the SQL queries for that particular implementation stay with that implementation. We don't, we don't put anything in a central location. Um, so if I was building, if I was better developer, this would be in a person's repository and that's where the SQL would live, but I'm being lazy now. So we're not going to do any of that stuff. All right. Uh, I see some chatter over there, but I don't see any questions. I think you're all just talking about store procedures, duh, 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 all that good stuff. So, all right. So I have my, my SQL can, um, command. I have my connection that's already created. Now I'm just gonna say results and we'll ask the connection. I forgot to await. 
I tell it, I want to query async return person object and pass in that SQL. This will go execute the SQL, get back the result set and turn that result set into, let's see how well the zoom works here. Oops, two, four, there we are. I returns an I enumerable a person. So it's gonna do that mapping and give us back all the results. So even though this might have zero results or a million results, it's gonna give me back an I enumerable in all cases. Uh, I'm gonna take this and actually I'm gonna move my okay up. I'm just gonna return okay. We'll hit F5. Did I leave Postman open? I did not leave Postman open. All right, I'm gonna open Postman and back up. While this builds. All right, Postman taking this sweet time today, preparing your workspace. It might take a few minutes. Ain't nothing in there, folks. Come on, come on. I would say for the record, I had Postman open like less than an hour ago and it was working fine. My mistake was closing it. <sighs> Must be hopping. <laughs> All right. So in Postman, I'm going to go set up my, I think it's just API slash Dapper. Yep. API slash Dapper. I just need something to make the call. We're not going to actually do any work in here, but I just want to show you the calls. What are you talking about? Could not get a response. What are you talking about? Piece of crap. All right. For some reason, it, it works in Edge. Oh, well. All right. So I hit my SQL. Yay. We'll step into our connection. And those who do a lot of ADO.net notice I have skipped a step. I didn't open my connection. So this obviously won't work because if this were just traditional ADO.net code, it would throw an exception saying you didn't open your connection. Oh, well, let's look at that. My results. Come on, 5,004 of them. Holy crap, it worked. Yay. And if we look at the results set from Edge, there we go. Uh, and so there's a problem with 5,000 results. It takes Edge a second to, to format them all. Oh, but there we go. Oh, I have a couple issues. Um, all right, first name, last name. Those aren't mapping correctly because, because why? Oh, because last time I did this demo, we talked about problem. Actually, no, I did this on purpose. <laughs> to show you a point. Dapper is only doing the mappings. So when it pulls in first name, last name, and our and middle name, it doesn't know how to map these to first, middle, and last name. How do you solve that problem? And I actually have a slide for this a little bit later, but we might as well cover it now. Dapper, there's a couple of ways to solve this in Dapper. I'm actually just going to tell you the most obvious one you should use, um, uh, you should change the mapping. So when you create the the SQL commands, you should, um, what's it? I forgot what the term is for this. Um, instead of first name, you need to basically redirect the, you need to rename alias. Thank you, chat. I appreciate it. Y'all get cookies. Tell Chad y'all get cookies. So that's right. You need to alias the, the column names. And when you do that, so API slash dapper. And when we look at our results set, I have my first name, last name, middle name. And this, this should work. Uh, yeah, so last time I did that, I forgot to, <laughs> I forgot to revert that code. Um, so that's a small problem. Uh, one of the things that we do is you, we're usually developing the database at the same time that we're developing our APIs against the database. So the names typically match anyway. Um, so not necessarily a problem for us. When I've gone into some legacy projects where we're pulling stuff out of the, 
database and there they have dumb names like um <laughs> it's the type of things where the table is called table persons instead of just assuming well i know it's a table um in those cases you don't want to you don't want your c sharp objects to match what's in the database you need to alias them so your code can make sense um and you don't have to match to to your database there are other mechanisms for setting up call mappings but they take way more than two minutes to to discuss so i'm not going to go down that road uh, i actually do have those resources in the slides and on my website so if you are interested you can go down that road all right but this is this is a really good example i'm taking basic sql and I'm getting back a list of objects. Yay, everything's amazing, everyone is happy. Let me move that over. Okay, now what you're probably seeing, Kim, that's all great and good, but normally I'm not just doing open select statements, I'm passing in some sort of parameter. How would I handle that with Dapper? All right, well, let's talk about that next. Let's take my SQL statement and let's actually go into uh, SQL Management Studio. You say, well, where the date of birth is greater than, I don't know, 2000. So we'll say 2000, January 01. How many results? Uh, so out of 5,000 results, that should return 1,500 results. All right, well, let's add that condition. Well, back in my SQL statement, again, remember, I, I will keep this all in C sharp because it's all, it's just one line. Date of birth, and I need to pass in a parameter. Well, we also need to be cognizant of uh, SQL injection issues. So we don't want to inject, we don't want to do a string builder or anything like that and inject um, rebuilding the stream. We want to do true parameter binding. And another reason you want to do parameter binding just for optimization. Because if you're passing in parameterized queries into, say, a SQL server, SQL server will optimize for those. And that way, if you're making this call over and over and over again with different parameter values, you're really only optimizing for one query, not for multiple queries. So date of birth, we'll just pass in, let's say, DOB. I'm using the at sign. This is very close to how you would do it in actual SQL. So if I was over here in management studio and i said all right well let's declare uh <laughs> DOB, oops um uh as a daytime offset you know it doesn't even need to be that we could just say daytime well it's a it's the same pattern i would use for my um my object naming except i'm just doing it in a string then down here in the query i'm just passing in my sql and then i need to pass in the parameter for Dapper to do the parameter binding. Well, that's the next parameter. And let's see if we can zoom in here for you. All right, so object parameter is equal to null. It's by default, but I could just pass in a new, I'm just using an anonymous object. And we'll pass in uh, date time, because I'm lazy, I'm gonna parse date time. Now let's close the bracket. There we go. You could pass in a real object. If you had an object created that was just called um, query parameters, I don't care what you call it, you could pass that in instead. Just as far as Dapper is concerned, it just needs to be an object that has the property on it or a field on it called DOB. If I go back and rerun this, Hello world, API slash Dapper. We get our SQL, we'll step through it, get our result back. All right, didn't error, so yeah, first unit test. Uh, 1,505, that's what I was expecting. And if I return these, they're all date of births that are greater than January 1st, 2000. So yay, we just successfully did a parameterized query. Everyone's happy. There was much rejoicing. Let's take a look at chat. Uh, always put as, uh, all right. So you're talking about aliasing. Yep. Pretty, 
protecting yourself from sql ejection is why i thought you would always defer to store procedure yeah not always the case if you're parameterizing your queries you i mean you're you're safer in this point uh always use parameters yep um yes yeah i'm a huge advocate of that make sure you parameterize everything um there now i say that and there's like at least three cases i can think of off the top of my head where i have not done that but i have very specific reasons for doing it that way um it's also not using user injected data so it's like a background service where we're uh, we're basically creating a, a SQL query on the fly based off of uh, different conditions, but it's never user injected data. Actually, no, we still do. <laughs> we still do parameterized queries in that case. Let me show you how we do it. Let's take, actually, let's take our date of birth. Um, let's just run through a dumb example because this might have been next on my list. Yes, it was next on my list. It's almost like I know what I'm doing. Let's assume you're building a query on the fly. And uh, so you're building some sort of search function. So search functions all kind of work the same way. You have a base query and given what someone wants to search for, you need to, you need to add your know, where clauses. Well, here's just a, let's just, let's make this up. So SQL is going to a query builder and we'll say, this is a new string builder. I know string builder, just go with me for a moment. Uh, we'll pass in our initial SQL. We'll say, if true, <laughs> just go with me. Uh, we're going to append a new line. And that will be where date of birth is less than uh, B.O.B. All right, now, because this is conditional, how do you know whether or not uh, you should pass in uh, a query. So I'm going to say my query builder, we'll pop that to a string. So it sends in the actual SQL. I'm going to show you another way to pass in parameters called dynamic, new dynamic parameters. Nope. All right. So parameters. So what we do when we build more complicated filters, uh, we'll use this general approach where whenever we add a where clause and that where clause has one or more queries, um, uh, parameters associated with it, we'll use dynamic parameters to add, oh no, oops. Uh, we'll add a parameter and you give it a name, so we'll call it DOB and you give it a value. So new date, time, eh, no, I don't have time for that. Let's just do date, time, parse. 2000, 01, 01. So it, it basically becomes a dictionary of uh, query parameters. And then you can take these query parameters and you pass those in as the second parameter. And boom, everything works and everyone's happy. Talk through this process again. I'll set a breakpoint there. All right, let's call our endpoint. Oh, <laughs> it's always going to be true, but if true, we're going to pin to our query builder. So if we look at the, um, the query again built, uh, you can't do that, but it depends where data birth is greater than DOB. We add a parameter to our dynamic parameters, which can have zero to as many as you want. And we call our query. Our query result still has 1,500 results in it. Those will get sent back to the browser or to your client. And boom, everything still works. So I use dynamic parameters a lot for very specific use cases. If, if it's a case like in our repositories or our services where we, it's always going to be the same criteria no matter what, uh, we'll just use objects or we'll use anonymous objects. Uh, sometimes it's just easier to put an anonymous object in, uh, in your code. But dynamic parameters we definitely use because our, 
our main, one of our main search functions is probably it's 200 lines, 300 lines of just logic. Like, all right, if they want this criteria, we need to make sure these rules apply. So we have to add this where clause and we have to inject these three parameters. Um, so it's like dynamic parameters makes out all, all so easy, but at the end, like at the end of 300 lines of code, we just do connection query async <laughs> and we pass in the SQL that we generated, um, which is parameterized. And then we pass in the dynamic parameters and it, all the magic happens underneath the scenes. All right. All right. Uh, what do I want to talk about next? Let me check out chat. All right. Cuts off six to 50 lines of code from how I do it. Yeah. That's, that's generally where I'm getting at is it's, it should save you time. It should save you just like coding cycles. Um, because like this mapping a 5,000, you know, column or 5,000 row list into objects is not, it's a little bit tedious. It, it's tedious doing it once doing it tedious for every p potential query that you can make is even more tedious. What if we didn't even want the object? Let's go, let's talk about this. What if, well, query async person, what if I didn't want to have an actual person object? And this happens. I have a couple queries where we don't, we, we might get back a result set. And I just don't feel like it's worth my time or effort to build an object definition for that one query. Well, you could just take that off. So let's call it with no, uh, no generic at all. You just say query async. Well, oh, you can kind of see it down here. Let me mouse over it. It's going to return an enumerable of dynamic. So it's going to take advantage of C sharp features. So let's return a dynamic object. Let's run this. Um, I'm not recommending or not recommending this way. Uh, it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I think for larger data sets where, um, like, I might have. 10, 10 or so versions of a select statement for persons, I'll just create the object. Um, but if I want to create the objects in just regular cases, I'll use dynamic. So let's go through the same process again, query async, returns okay. But now if we scroll down to results, see instead of persons, let me give it a second, because it has to, to look at the data. Uh, they're going to come back as dapper rows. So this is a dynamic object, but it has the same properties. First, middle, last, um, you know, date of birth, whatnot, all that's in there. And yep, there we go. So same data, just it's coming back as a dynamic instead of as a strongly typed object. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, what do I want to talk to you about next? Um, okay, uh, all right, I want to come back to that. Let's talk about, let's just talk about some basic link. Uh, so if you've used link in the past, you probably have language integrated query. Uh, you know that there are, oops, not what I wanted. Uh, there are a couple of helpers on link commands like uh, first, last, first or default, um, single, and turns out that Dapper has a lot of these already built into them. So when I, let's say I do query async and I am passing in a person object, this is going to return every row. So it's going to do what's called a, um, it's like, it's a buffer read. So it's not going to lazy load anything. It's going to give you all 1500, all 5,000 records. Um, where you might just want one record. <laughs> so what if you just wanted to pull one record? We could say query first or default async. And this is a little bit more optimized call where it's going to go make the request, return uh, the first row, but the first row only. It's not going to buffer all that other content. Uh, so if you have particular calls you're making where you know you're only going to get back one request, Maybe do first or default. Um, or, I mean, so I'm using default. So if there's nothing, 
it's just going to return. Um, it's going to return an empty list. Uh, if I said just first, very first async, it'll throw an exception if there's nothing in there because there's there's nothing to return. Um, so there's little helpers like that. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. What else do I want to do? All right, let's talk about multi-mapping. Multi-mapping isn't... Well, actually, how am I on time? All right, I got a little bit of time. So, um, oh, what's that we're saying? Since it's actually isn't actually changing the query, it shouldn't be confused with any frameworks first or default where it does modify this query. Search. That's right. Yep. So it's uh, it's more just uh, operational syntax underneath the scenes. Uh, and if you want to exercise, go read the source code for how that stuff implemented. All right, so let's talk about another concept. Uh, do I want to talk about multi-mapping first? Or, you know what? No, no, no. I'll come back to multi-mapping. I've been just talking about selects <laughs> uh, this whole time. And selects are, are good, but they're, they're, those aren't the only type of things that you do. Let's talk about inserts, updates, and deletes. So non-queries, more things that you execute. Well, let's go back over into SQL Server. And let's go into our person's. Okay, well, let's generate an insert query. Something, something simple. All right, so inserts, we have an identity on the ID. And then I first name, middle name, last name, date of birth, and last login date. Well, I'm going to take this query. I'm going to copy it. Go back over into my code. I'm going to, we're going to delete all this crap. We are going to try that again, delete all that crap. Uh, we're going to change our SQL statement and then we'll paste it in. This is still something I would do in just uh, string constants. We're going to fill in the blank. So first name, I'll say first, last, sorry, middle, last, date of birth, and then last, our last login day, we could just do get UTC, uh, get UTC date. Um, did I do that right? Oh, all right. <laughs> I can't remember. That's the problem with jumping back and forth between different languages. It's like, all right, I remember how to do it here. I don't remember the syntax. So let's take that insert statement. And if I create a new person, so a new person and a person has... Uh, so we'll say first, Kevin, and this is what I should have a snippet for, but I don't, so sorry, uh, date of birth, um, make me older than I really am. You know what? We'll just, we'll just do my year. So cars. So we'll say 1983, not really the right date, but the right year. Um, last login I, date, I don't need to do. So the four critical pieces of information, uh, first, middle, last, date of birth. Now with, uh, any, or with um, Dapper, I just need to say, all right, uh, I want to await connection, execute async. I'm going to... Nope, that's not it. Execute. Yep, execute async. Oh, there's an overload. <laughs> I was looking at it wrong. We'll pass in the SQL, and then we'll pass in the object. So, yay, that's all good. Uh, and this will return the int for the number of rows that were um, changed. So it should just be one in this case run through this code. I'm going to hit set a breakpoint. All right. We'll bring our code over here. We'll hit API slash dapper. Uh, so Edward, imagine pulling back a whole table and just taking one. Yeah, that's, that's why you try to build in some of these protections by using the correct extension method. All right. Well, so we'll create our person. We'll do execute, which does our insert for us. And uh, results is one, so yay. And we can prove it. Oh, did I? All right, so 
if I do select all and go to the bottom of the list, you can tell I've done this demo a couple of times. So here, this, this is our latest entry for today. All right. Yay. That all worked great. Now I'm going to show you another like nice thing with Dapper. I don't even think I have these in the slides. I don't have these in the slides. So yay, we're going to show you something else. Uh, instead of doing a new person, let me do this off the top of my head. We're going to create a list of persons. But sometimes you're not inserting just one object. You're inserting multiple objects, right? So persons is equal to a new list of persons. And inside a person, we might just have a, a collection. So let me format this. Stop debugging so the green squigglies don't yell at me. Did I get my syntax right? Let's turn. All right. Uh, so persons, I'm going to take and make three copies. So we have Kevin. So this will be Bill, Gina, and um, Og. <laughs> this is the worst part about live, live coding on the fly. So like, right, I have to come up with names. All right, so instead of persons passing, I'm uh, instead of person, I'm going to pass in persons. Same, so one execute, but I'm going to send in a list instead of just um, just the one. So let's set the breakpoint again. All right, Dapper. All right, go to our endpoint. All right, by my list of three persons. And now if I go look at result, results going to tell me, hey, you executed that insert statement three times because the results is equal to three. So now if I go back and run this query one more time, go down here to the bottom, we have Bill, Gene, and Dog. Uh, I, I show that because I have written... I didn't know this feature existed <laughs> and I wrote a whole bunch of insert code where we were, we were basically building batch inserts uh, by hand and we were sending those in the dapper and it ended up being like 30 to 50 lines of code to do all this work. Um, turns out I didn't have to do that. I only had to create one insert statement, pass in the list that I wanted to uh, execute. It would do the batch <laughs> for me automatically. Uh, Wow, that would have saved me so much time and effort and energy and also been a little bit less buggy because there were less things to do. Um, but this, this works great. Just passing the list of things that you want to um, insert. I don't think that works for updates. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that doesn't work for updates because I don't think updates can follow the same logic. But this works oh amazingly well. Um, Josh, I am with you. It is time to go refactor some code. When I discovered this little tip, um, I, I just kind of, my jaw dropped. <laughs> and it's, it's the thing about a lot of these libraries is you will learn these little tricks over time and go, I was so dumb. <laughs> Why did I do this the hard way? Um, all right. So I got about 10 minutes left. Let me, let me switch over to slides for my last little topics. Uh, all right, so there's this other concept called multi-mapping, which I'm not the hugest fan of doing, um, but any framework does this sort of thing. So I thought I would discuss it. Uh, all right, so let's talk about this. Let's talk, let's talk about this example. I have a person, um, and a person might have something associated with it, um, like a phone number. Um, I don't matter what any framework calls it, but this is like, it's a, so phone number isn't stored in the same table as person. It's actually part of a join that's coming out of another table. Um, I forgot what kind of property it's called. So maybe someone check can, can tell me. So if I'm looking at the database, I have a persons, but then maybe I want to uh, enter join uh, phone, uh, I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna call it phone on 
ID is equal to a person's dot ID. And then you have a phone, I forgot what's in this, basically phone number. Um, so if I run that, eh, yeah, I know it's ambiguous, F off. Uh, <laughs> you ever tell your code to go put it where the sun don't shine? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know it's ambiguous. Okay. Okay, so phone number. Phone number's in another table. I can do a join to get it, but... I want, I bring this object back. How do I handle this in code? Well, you could just make phone number a property under a person. You could do that. Um, but like my per phone here has, uh, you know, phone name as well. So let's say pp.name. <laughs> Never mind. Um, I'm 13. All right. So. <laughs> Let's call it here. Phone, it's a cell phone. Phone, it's a home phone. Uh, and and it's only one to one. I'm not even messing with the many, the um, the one to many uh, correlation here. So I'm not 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 dealing with that. Uh, oh, you know what? You're absolutely right. Yep, it should be person ID. Thank you. So slightly changes the results. Uh, same thing. I'm getting back a phone number and getting back a name. And I don't want to necessarily add these as properties to the person. Maybe it's a, it's a subclass, um, under the, under the person like I have here, I have phone and maps phone to name. Um, so what we could do is let's take this query. Let's just go and take this query, write this code. I'm feeling adventurous. Let's take this query. Let's remove all this crap. And let's take our insert statement. We're going to replace this with that SQL we just wrote. Okay. Then <laughs> say results is equal to, let me bring up my uh, da, da, da. Oh, I lost my notes. Oh, I don't have the notes for this. This is not an easy query to write. So I need, oh my gosh. All right, I'm gonna to try to do this on the fly. <laughs> um, if not, I, I'm, I'm done after this. So let me make sure there's nothing else important that I wanna talk about. No, 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 no. All right, you're all with me for the ride, okay? I don't advocate doing this and you're about to see why. All right, so I wanna query async. Um, uh, oh, stop debugging so I get some good IntelliSense. Query async. Um, pass in SQL. Um, I'm going to pass in my type. So I, oh man. Now I really wish I had my notes. I, so I have a slide with notes on it and it's empty. And I'm not sure why. <laughs> it's because the, all right, so, oh man. So then you're supposed to do a mapping. You know what? I'm not gonna be able to do this off the top of my head because it's awful. But what I will do is I will go to the document. Uh, the, so it's called multi-mapping. Yep, multi-mapping. Uh, yep, that's that's what I was trying to do right there. So when in doubt, RTFM. Query async, we pass in SQL. Then we pass in a lambda of a person and a phone number, but it returns a person object. This is one of the things where I think any framework does a much better job. All right, so. So it's a it's the person. Oh, nope, I got this wrong. Phone and the person. So if we look at person, oh, why is it? Because I forgot the last thing. So then it returns a person. All right. Now if I look at person, 
what we're trying to do is we're trying to tell Dapper what should it do in this case where it's getting uh, it's getting a result set back, and I want to split that result set between two different objects. So I'm telling it if it's, it's a crazy generic. I have a person object, I have a phone object, and then I want to return a person object. There's my query. But then I have to tell it how to do the mapping. So person data, the phone data, and then for this, I'll tell it that the person dot phone is going to be equal to phone. That part should work. And then there's one more parameter. Uh, oh, I have to return person. All right. And then there's one more thing you have to do is you have to do split on. And split on just tells it where is the divide, and that's going to be on phone number. All right. Now let's assume I did all that correctly. Oh, and thank you for giving me the the help in the chat. <laughs> I wasn't even paying attention to that. That would have made my life a little bit easier. All right. Let's run this again. Uh, so the reason I have to split on the name phone number is it will, by default, look for IDs. So if I did pp.id, it would split on ID automatically, but I'm not returning the ID, so I need to tell it where that split happens in the code. Run this again, query. So now if I look at my results, oh, I forgot to await. Where were y'all with the await? Actually, I, I really feel sometimes that should be a compiler error. You didn't wait on the async and you probably meant to. Can be a warning. All right, let's try that again. So now, no, no, no. All right, let me look at. Results, let's look at one of them. So name for, uh, oh, I forgot to do my aliasing, but we're not going to worry about that. But if we look at phone, Phone maps to home and to phone number. So it's doing the split for me like we expected to. All right. So yay, we have a win. I have one use case where I use this in an application. After that, I really try to avoid this because I feel like this can get, this could break um, easier than not. What we'll end up doing, and just, just depends on your circumstances, is that when we're building because we're dealing the databases alongside with the, the code and the models uh, at the same time is we will actually, I will more likely just build some sort of like query model and then uh, use something like auto mapper or whatnot on the, on the other end to map to, to real objects. Um, I wish I had time to talk about auto mapper because that's a good extension of just functionality after you, you're, you pulled in dapper. Um, so like, like if you were doing MVC or something like that, you would use a view model. So your view model might not necessarily match what your database model looks like, but you can map from one to the other. I would almost follow a similar approach with code. So if I'm talking to a database and I'm doing a, a join like I'm doing here, I might have a database model that then I... I uh, will map to other cases. Uh, I try to avoid code like this just because you saw me screw up you know, like now. And I mean, the good news is once this is written, you don't have to worry about it again afterwards, but you're also writing non-generic code. Uh, so this is code that's very specific to, uh, to a SQL statement. Uh, and I try to keep things more generic as possible, but that's just me. And that's also you know, close to time. So I'm going to throw up the my information. Uh, I appreciate And also I'll throw up that URL. Oops. But I thank you all for hanging out with me today. There's the link. Um, I'll hang out, hang out for a couple minutes, answer any questions you might have, have any philosophical discussions. Brad, thank you. Don't forget your cookie. <laughs> Andre, that, that was a horrible session, but Kevin's such a nice guy. <laughs>
Nick, thanks for coming out. Mark, thanks for coming out. <laughs> I appreciate that, Andre. That I really appreciate that. Ever take care. Thank you. All righty. Uh, Jody found EF to be a little overwhelming, but Dapper to be very compelling and worthwhile. Awesome. That's, that's, what I hope. Uh, I'm the same way. I, I, I understand what EF is trying to do, but then there are so many nuances for accomplishing that goal uh, where I just go, if I could just write the sequel, I could fix this. Like I know how to write the sequel for this statement. And, uh, <laughs> and then EF just tries to fight you every step of the way. Andre, I appreciate that. Well, if they do any sort of feedback for these, I would appreciate the positive feedback. How to write your own extension method. Yep. Awesome. Josh, thank you. Yeah, the split on ID, I found by uh, I found that on accident because I wasn't splitting them by ID and it wasn't working. It's like, well, it should obviously work. Yeah, it's because I wasn't splitting on ID. And if, if I had time, I would do a whole nother session just on contrib. So, um, Jody, I think dynamics with inserts works with contrib. I don't believe you can do that with just dapper out of the box. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. I have to try. Use EF for cred and then auto mapping. Yep. Oh, Jody, no, I was wrong with that. I I wasn't thinking straight about it. Uh you should be able to use um you should be able to use dynamics or uh, anonymous objects. That should all work. Sorry, I I was thinking something else and answer your question incorrectly. And so one thing to keep in mind with dynamics versus uh strongly typed objects, there is a slight performance hit when you're using dynamics. I mean, we're not talking much. We're talking milliseconds, but if you're doing a lot of calls, it's it might add up to something. Um, there's benchmarking available on, uh, let's see, I had the Dapper stuff up. So there are benchmarks on Dapper uh, where they compare a lot of different use cases. Yeah, uh, not and not just them, but also other other platforms as well. So, Hand coded data table, Dapper, Dapper using dynamics, um, Dapper using strongly typed objects. Uh, we'd have to go through and and look at a lot of this stuff. My favorite is just going to end. That's where all the EFs are. <laughs> They're at the bottom of the list. Um, it's okay to take the milliseconds. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I say unless unless it's going to be uh, something the user notices, I will take the hit. Um, we have one, we have a background process where, uh, when we originally wrote it, it took 15 minutes because it was a lot of processing on our part. And that's the type of case where it's, I say, all right, let me try to optimize this as much as possible. And we got it. We got a worst case down to five minutes, uh, best case, 20 seconds. Um, and it's just through optimizations. And that's the type of thing where we're doing, a bunch of updates, a bunch of inserts, and then you just hit the you hit the bottleneck, not being your code, it's the database because you're trying to throw so many queries at it at one time. Um, that there's only so much you can do based off of its uh, hardware and configuration. All righty, friends. Well, uh, uh, that's Aaron. Thank you. All right, we'll turn off screen share. And again, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of Cotapalooza, and I'll see you hopefully in person next year.